Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, this month's program, the October 2020 virtual field trip to the Cleveland Lakefront Nature Preserve. Uh, my name is Michelle Brocious, and I am your uh, bird walk leader this evening. Uh, before we dive into the program, I want to take a moment to acknowledge that today is Veterans Day, so I want to thank um, all our, our members and guests uh, if you served in the military. So thank you very much. Um, a quick note, uh, just what this is all about in case you don't know or fully understand. So during the month of October, I invited our members and guests to um, Cleveland Lakefront Nature Preserve to visit the location, go birding, um, or enjoy nature, enjoy the other animals there, and then to submit something to me about that experience. So I get a lot of journaling and pictures and bird lists, and um, that's basically what is in this presentation tonight, uh, but I would accept uh, poetry. Um, I really would love to get a poem or some artwork someday, so we'll keep my fingers crossed for that. Um, and so I gather these items and put them into the scrapbook that I'm going to present to you tonight, and we do this every month. Uh, this month in November is uh, the, oh, what is it called? The Heritage Preserve or something like that. Let's see, you can help me out, put that in the chat. I wasn't prepared with my notes. All right, so next slide. All right, so the Cleveland Lakefront Nature Preserve um, is where we had the field trip in October. Uh, the Port of Cleveland website describes the Cleveland Lakefront Nature Preserve as a unique urban wildlife haven on Lake Erie, and it is certainly that and much more. The original shoreline was part of Gordon Park until 1962 when two old freighters were sunk offshore to create a break wall. So here, I have my mouse on the screen, here is Gordon Park, and I believe what it's saying is the shoreline went straight across and then they sunk two freighters up here and over here. Um, and then this land here just kind of filled in, and I will read about that. So the land area between the break wall and shoreline, known as Dyke 14, was formed due to routine dumping of waste and sediment, primarily sand, soil, and clay, that was dredged from the Cuyahoga River between 1979 and 1999. The land quickly filled with plants, shrubs, and trees when Dyke 14 ceased being used as a dumping area for sediment, and the area is now known as Cleveland Lakefront Nature Preserve. Uh, the CLNP is comprised of 88 acres and has three trails covering two and a half miles. The area is a diverse mix of habitats, including grasslands, forests, meadows, mudflats, shrublands, and wetlands. And for more information, please visit the Port of Cleveland website um, about the preserve. And it, when uh, you get this uh, presentation, this link is active, and you can click that um, and read more information. Oh, hi, and Gloria just joined. Hi, Gloria. And Carew just mentioned it's Richfield Heritage Preserve. That is where um, we are going this month for our field trip. So if you want to go out there and check it out, um, that would be great. And let me know what you see there. All right, so at the um, Cleveland Lakefront Nature Preserve, I identified three um, different types of birds to try and find. So the first is the fall warblers. So a warbler is a small songbird in the family Perulidae, most of which sport bright colors and interesting patterns in the spring. However, they tone down their plumage after breeding season, which can make them more challenging to identify. Uh, warblers primarily feed on insects and depend on a warm climate where their main food source can thrive. They therefore migrate to the tropics in the winter and return north in the spring as temperatures begin to rise. Western Cuyahoga Audubon hosted a fall warbler identification program to help with some of those more confusing fall warblers. Ryan Jacob, ornithologist, naturalist, and bird bander with Black Swamp Bird Observatory discussed field marks and features to look for on fall warblers. The information presented is useful for new, newer birders as well as seasoned birders and an extensive number of species are covered. So I've provided the link um, to that program. You can also just go to the wcaudubon.org website and type in Fall Warbler Identification Program in the search and um, it'll come right up. I also identified kinglets. 
Um, there are two that we could see at the preserve. The golden crown kinglet uh, are boldly marked with a black eyebrow stripe and flashy lemon yellow crest. A good look can require some patience as they spend much of their time high up in dense spruce or fir foliage. Uh, to find them, listen for their high thin call notes and song. Though barely larger than a hummingbird, this frenetically active bird can survive minus 40 degree nights, sometimes huddling together for warmth. They breed in the far north and, um, and mountain west and visit most of North America during winter. Uh, so that is a description from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Um, and as you can see, there is a picture of a very cute golden crown kinglet taken by Tom Fishburne. I really think that is the cutest bird picture I've ever seen. I just I love its big eyes. Very cute. Um, also seen at the preserve last month, ruby crown kinglets. Uh, a tiny bird seemingly overflowing with energy, the ruby crown kinglet forages almost frantically through lower branches of shrubs and trees. Its habit of constantly flicking its wings is a key identification clue. Smaller than a warbler or chickadee, this plain green-gray bird has a white eye ring and a white bar on the wing. Alas, the male's brilliant ruby crown patch usually stays hidden. Your best chance to see it is to find an excited male singing in spring or summer. And then lastly, um, a really good bird to see last month and, and probably continuing into this month are the sparrows. So sparrows have short, thick bills for crushing and eating seeds. Most species also eat insects. They are usually brown or gray in color and range from the smaller streaked sparrows to the larger towhees. Uh, Dark-eyed juncos and snow buntings are also included in the sparrow family. Many sparrows have distinctive head patterns, as you can see in the photo to the left of the white-crowned sparrow. And that um, picture is, again, taken by Tom Fishburne at the preserve. Uh, learn how to identify some common sparrows at the Great Backyard Bird Count website. Uh, I really love that website. Uh, they list uh, a handful, maybe six or seven sparrows. And it's really simple. Under each picture, they just list a few um, identification um, factors there for you. And I, I think it's really simple and easy. So uh, if you need help with sparrow identification, please um, check that out. I just want to see our attendee list here. OK, great. All right, so to kick us off this evening, Marianne and John Henderson um, birded on October 8th and tallied 35 species. Uh, so the notable ones I always highlight in red, uh, they found both of the kinglets, the golden crown and the ruby crown. Uh, they also found five red-breasted nuthatches, and I have the, included that picture taken by Tom Fishburne on the left-hand side there. I think that's a really awesome urban birding photo on the chain link fence there. And then continuing their list, uh, they, they found a variety of sparrows, a chipping sparrow, dark-eyed junco, white-crowned sparrow, white-throated sparrow, and song sparrow, and then uh, three warblers, magnolia warbler, palm warbler, and yellow rumped warbler. Um, and again, enjoying that photograph taken by Tom Fishburne of a white-throated sparrow. I love the colors in that. It really is a nice fall photo. Alan Rand visited uh, the preserve four times, uh, October 4th, 13th, 23rd, and 25th, and tallied 74 species. Uh, notable species include the pileated woodpecker, peregrine falcon, blue-headed, and red-eyed vireo. Um, also, he saw a Carolina wren. Um, and a wonderful picture um, taken by Al Rand of the Carolina Wren. Now, he got a lifer. So congratulations to Al. He saw a purple finch. And that's obviously a, a female, as it doesn't have the red um, on its body. Um, he also saw a golden crown kinglet, a ruby crown kinglet, so both kinglets. Uh, also, a lifer um, got a sedge wren as well. So that's two lifers in one trip. Congratulations to Al. And then a whole bunch of sparrows and warblers. So he saw the fox, sparrow, clay-colored field, white-crowned, white-throated, song sparrow, Lincoln's swamp. He saw an eastern towhee and a dark-eyed junco. 
Uh, and then for um, warblers, the black and white, Tennessee, Nashville, Warning, Common Yellow Throat, Black Burnian, Northern Perula, Magnolia, and Bay Breasted Warbler. And then he took uh, three photos here that I've shared with you, the, the fox sparrow on the top, um, a male eastern towhee in the middle, and then a female eastern towhee at the bottom. Oh, continuing with the warblers, <clears throat> a chestnut sided, black pole, black throated blue, palm, an American red start, and yellow rumped warbler, um, black throated green warbler, and Wilson's warbler. And then another lifer, the northern sawwet owl, which was seen just outside the preserve at Gordon Park. Um, he asked if he could include it, and of course, Gordon Park is right next door, and it was uh, the same trip that he took in which he saw the Sawlet Owl. And then he took a beautiful picture of a female red-winged blackbird um, at the preserve. All right, and then my submission, I went on October 16th. I tallied 19 species, so not quite as impressive as Owl's 74. Um, I, I, I kind of feel funny presenting <laughs> my list after his, uh, but I did get a lifer as well. I had never seen a marsh wren before, and I um, I found one, so yay. <laughs> it's always exciting. Um, so I took Friday, October 16th off work to enjoy the golden autumn sunshine and crisp air at the Cleveland Lakefront Nature Preserve. It had rained the day prior, bringing in a cold spell, which resulted in a 42 degree starting temperature at 8.54 a.m., only warming up to a still cool 50 degrees by the time I left at 11.42 a.m. However, I dressed for the cooler temps and had a very pleasant walk. I chose to walk the perimeter trail and was immediately inundated by sparrows. Walking a little further along the first leg of the trail, I came across a marsh wren. This is a lifer for me. I thought it was a Carolina wren until I was at home later in the day looking through my photos and something seemed off for this Carolina wren. Uh, Carolinas are more chestnut in color and this bird in my photo was also missing the butterscotch belly that Carolina wrens have. As you can see, this belly here is white. Um, I pulled out my trusty Kaufman Field Guide to Birds of North America and after browsing through the wren section, I decided on a marsh wren as it has the bold white stripes on the black triangle on its back accompanied by a light belly. So it was a good day for sparrows at the preserve as there were easily 100 sighted throughout my entire visit, consisting of mostly white-crowned, white-throated song and dark-eyed junco. I paused on my walk to reflect on how far I've come in the three years I've been birding. Uh, just a few years ago, sparrows were known to me as little brown birds, except for the junco, which is a little gray bird. Now that's a, a big joke, the little brown bird thing, but Seriously, that's, that's where I was. There's just a brown bird over there. Um, I still need help. It, I'd still need the help of a field guide or friends on the internet with some sparrows, but these four I can identify on sight. Um, my only warbler was the yellow rumped, which is pretty easy for me to identify with the bright yellow patch on its backside just above the tail, also known as the rump. And then here's my um, picture of one of the white-throated sparrows I saw at the preserve. So I realized about a half hour into my walk that I was concentrating so much on taking pictures that I wasn't truly observing the birds around me. Perhaps balancing birding with photography is something that will come over time. Um, and I am a, a new photographer as well. So I have these two new hobbies that you know I'm trying to balance <laughs> um, and be successful at both. Um, so in all, I was still able to identify 19 species that I logged into eBird and observe bird behavior. Mostly they were foraging and chasing one another. Um, I rounded a bend and saw a female northern flicker on the trail ahead. The closer I got on the approach, the farther she hopped away from me. I did manage to close the gap a little bit for a photo. All of a sudden, a flock of approximately 15 blackbirds rose out of a nearby bush and gathered on a distant tree. I was hopeful they might be rusty blackbirds, as that would have been a lifer for me, but alas, they were red-winged blackbirds. Still lovely. Uh, the north-facing side of the preserve didn't hold as many birds as the south and east facing sides, but I did come across my first dark eye junco of the day along that section of the trail. Also, I was delighted to see a Cooper's hawk fly overhead and then a few moments later, a second Cooper's. And there's the picture I, I got of the northern flicker. And you can tell it's a female in case you don't know that the males have a like a black mustache, black mark that comes down from the bill and females don't. 
Uh, the west facing trail is where I saw the mallard, a single duck floating serenely in Lake Erie. I came across more sparrows and yellow rumped warblers along the way. Then when I rounded back to the south side again, I stumbled upon my favorite sparrow, the white crowned. Uh, there were three adults foraging on the trail and a juvenile off to the side sporting a chestnut and white cap instead of the black and white of its elders. I decided to walk the south and east sections of the trail again to take more pictures and then headed back to the gate. On my return journey, a blue jay screeched at me from above. I said, fine, I got you, as I logged him into eBird, my first blue jay of the day. He let me know he was there. Oh, and then here's just some pictures that I took. Um, the one on the left, uh, a couple of white-throated sparrows, and then on the right is a house finch. Uh, it, the, it actually, the house finch, I was really happy with that photo, except for the big branch that's going right in front of its face. Otherwise, it would have been a lot better. Uh, that's just how it is with photography, especially with animals. Um, another white-throated sparrow on the left there, and then um, I have a, white, a white-throated sparrow and two white-crowned sparrows, um, and that little circle in the bushes there. Uh, my yellow rumped warbler on the left and white crowned sparrows on the right. These two were part of the three I mentioned earlier that were foraging along the trail. And then there was another um, juvenile off to the side. Um, and then here's my list. So I, I have um, <clears throat> another angle of the marsh wren looking right at me. Uh, and then so there's my marsh wren uh, life reward. And then I saw the dark eyed junco, white crowned, white throated, song field, and chipping sparrows and a yellow rumped warbler. And then here is a Sean Missig's um, presentation. And uh, Sean, you're on the line, but I, I know that you've had me present it the past two times. Would you like me to do so again? Yeah, you can. Okay. I'll stop asking, and then if you ever want to do it, just let me know. <laughs> All right, so Sean saw a total of 11 species. Um, and visited the preserve two times. So he says, I visited the Cleveland Lakefront Nature Preserve two times in October, and I think I picked the two worst days. I was there on 1026 and 1027 at roughly 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. each day. These weren't the worst based on wildlife, but rather the weather conditions I was subjected to. And I, I, re I was in a meeting, Sean, with your dad on, I think it was on 1026, and he told me you were at the preserve that day, and I was like, oh no, because it was just the most miserable, drizzly, rainy day. <laughs> um, but, you know, like you said, it, it wasn't the worst based on wildlife, and I have found that to be true. Sometimes I'll go out birding, and it's a miserable day, but the birds are out. It, it just, you, you just never know. So you can potentially have a really great day seeing wildlife on really miserable days to be out. So anyways, uh, so Monday, 1026, I was supposed to have a break from the rain during my visit, but shortly after I arrived, it began raining again and didn't let up for about an hour. At this point, I was thankful I had coverage on my camera and my lens, so just in case something got wet, I was covered. There was a period of heavier rain where I took cover under a tree, but I was able to venture out after about 30 minutes of hiding. Despite the less than favorable conditions, the wildlife was very active. I was in disbelief of all the birds that were flying back and forth tree to tree, all the calls and all the answers from what seemed like 10,000 birds. Even the woodland critters were getting into the excitement. At this point, I was glad I stuck it out. My journey had begun on the perimeter trail where I really didn't see much other than seagulls floating in the wind. As I made my way to one of the shorter loop trails, I spotted a six point buck down the path from me. I was able to snap a few shots before he walked away. Uh, and there on the right is um, a, a picture of the six point buck that Sean took. I walked towards where he had entered the woods and saw several does near the path, and I was able to get a few shots of them as well. They definitely acted more like city deer than others you would see in the wild. <clears throat> excuse me. I am um, losing my voice, guys, so excuse me a moment. I might need to take sips of water throughout the presentation. All right, so they definitely acted more like city deer than others you see in the wild. They stared at me but really didn't care that I was there. As I continued, I made my way towards the Monarch Trail. On this trail, I spotted many sparrows and kinglets. These were the birds that were acting so crazy from the rain, and I was in awe at just how many there were. 
this is also the first time I had ever seen a kinglet, so I was excited to be able to snap some shots of them. They were very difficult to photograph as they jumped from branch to branch, reed to reed, and anything nearby. Many of the sparrows I saw were in full on, were in full on winter mode. They were large and their bodies looked like they were going to eat their head. <laughs> I'm not sure how they were flying, but they buzzed around like it was nothing. At the end of the Monarch Trail, I was put back on the perimeter trail and found my way to the Overlook. There was a nice view of downtown Cleveland and more seagulls. Next, I went to the Northern Harrier Trail and found more sparrows and kinglets. There wasn't much else for me that day as the rain continued and I think the animals had enough of it. So I set my sights on the next day. And on the right hand side, a picture of one of the does um, at the Nature Preserve uh, by Sean Missig. All right, and so uh, the Life for Award for the Golden Crown Kinglet. Um, and then also another beautiful photo of a song sparrow by Sean. And uh, the Sawat Owl uh, by Sean, another lifer, congratulations. All right, so I arrived Tuesday, 1027 after 11 a.m. and I was there at just the right time. As I walked up next to the ranger station, there were a few people looking up into one of the pine trees. They had spotted an owl high up and were trying to find the proper angle to get the shot. This owl was sitting within many branches and there were only two lines of sight to get the shot. I had first thought this could have been a screech owl based on its size and the fact that I couldn't see any color or detail to determine otherwise. I found out that it was actually a solid owl. This was the first time I had seen one or even heard of one for that matter. I was lucky enough to get a few shots and I was on my way. I was hoping this was a good omen to the day and it turned out that it was. The rain was not there. Uh, but it was colder than it had been and there was a little wind to contend with as well. As I entered, I didn't hear all of the calls I had heard the day before. I also started to the, I also started to the right on the perimeter trail rather than the left. I did see a large bird, likely a hawk, but it flew away as soon as it saw me and I missed that shot. A blue jay then flew in and perched on a tree in the distance, almost as if it were watching that large bird. I continued on the path and made it to the lake very quickly. There were seagulls again, but now there were a few double crested cormorants flying and fishing as well. So there are the lovely photos of the blue jay and the double crested cormorant that Sean took on his visit. Down the path further, I started to hear what sounded like chirping from a cardinal. I walked toward the sound and quickly discovered a chipmunk perched on a log at the perfect spot to amplify its chirping. He didn't seem to want his picture taken, but I had snapped a few shots before he ran off in embarrassment. As with the previous day, the Monarch and Northern Harrier Trails provided the most wildlife. I finally started to see sparrows and kinglets again, along with a juvenile robin and a very photogenic red-bellied woodpecker. The woodpecker was flying from tree to tree and would stop every now and again to eat some of the dark colored berries that were still left on some of the trees. As I made my way around the remaining trails, there wasn't much happening. I decided to leave. On my way out, I did see a wren off the path, but it escaped me and my camera. Um, so at the top, uh, American robin, uh, the chipmunk in the middle, and then uh, one of the pictures of the red belly woodpeckers um, by Sean. And then here's uh, two additional woodpecker shots. Um, very pretty. Right, so before this trip, I didn't even know this area existed. I was happy to learn of this location. and I will be making many trips here in the future. I enjoy my visits and all the wildlife I found, despite the weather not being favorable. And then here's Sean's list. Um, notable species, the golden crown kinglet, the northern sawat owl, and song sparrow. And Nancy, Nancy Howell submission. I'm looking to see if Nancy joined. I guess she couldn't make it today. All right, so I will cover Nancy's uh, slides. Uh, she uh, won the award for most number of species, 79 species. However, she did visit the preserve seven times. So that that's great that she made it out that much. Um, uh, she says the Cleveland Lakefront Nature Preserve, formerly known as Dyke 14, has an interesting history. The property is owned and managed by the Cleveland Port Authority, but surrounded by the Cleveland Lakefront Reservation of the Cleveland Metro Parks. It is important to know that Western Chicago Audubon was part of a team that created an educational component to the CLMP. A field guide, now in its second or third printing, discusses the history and formation of the property, as well as the plants and wildlife found there. 
The property is being managed by the port with assistance from the Cleveland Metro Parks. Invasive and non-native species are in the process of being removed, a process which will take many years. The 88 acres in, is rich in bird life and it was a wonderful place for the October virtual field trip as migrant songbirds utilize the area heavily. Thrushes, vireos, warblers, kinglets, sparrows, and more can be found. Michelle Brocious's choice for the virtual field trip and another rare bird, the northern sawwet owl. Okay, Michelle, what rarity will be next month? Well, um, you guys will just have to go <laughs> um, and, and find out uh, what I'm going to bring this month. Uh, I was also able to visit CLMP seven times during October. Each visit held wonderful sightings as well as adding to the warblers for the fall warbler challenge. All visits to Cleveland Lakefront Nature Preserve are listed on eBird. The 79 species tally during the seven visits is great. And so I included um, uh, just a picture of the preserve that I took. This is the perimeter trail, um, I believe on the east side of the trail. That's uh, Lake Erie off to the right there um, on the other side of those shrubs. It was very pretty. I, and I liked, I liked how the, the trees kind of arc over the trail. Um, it's very serene to walk there. All right, so <clears throat> Nancy saw a lot <laughs> on her on her visits. Um, so she says, October 5th, 2020, 58 species that day. Um, with wooded areas, fields, and Lake Erie, uh, the species ran the gamut of waterfowl to warblers to sparrows and more. So Canada geese, mallard, ring-billed gull, and double-crested cormorant made up the species that were on the lake. With varied habitat, uh, one also can get a variety of raptors, and this day provided bald eagle and cooper's hawk. Migrant time, yellow-bellied sapsuckers were sighted, the first of the fall for me. Lots of northern yellow shafted flickers were moving through the area, and it seems CLNP is the area they like. Red-eye and blue-headed vireo, along with golden-crowned and ruby-crowned kinglets, were among the migrants. Here's more. Red-breasted nuthatch, brown creeper, marsh wren, and swineson thrush. Sparrows enjoy the property as well, and today was a day for chipping field, white-crowned, white-throated savanna, song, lincolns, and swamp sparrows, along with dark-eyed junco and eastern towhee. Thirteen warbler species were found, Tennessee, Orange Crown, Nashville, Magnolia, Bay-breasted, Black Viridian, Yellow, Palm, Black-throated Green, and Wilson's warblers, along with common yellow-throat American Red Star and Northern Perula. Um, what's funny is I, I use the red to hide just the highlight species and her whole paragraph is basically red. So hopefully that's not too hard on the eyes. Uh, and a beautiful photo by Tom Fishburne of a, a male eastern towhee. Um, so October 8th, uh, 48 species. Once again, waterfowl, golds, and cormorant made the list due to Lake Erie's proximity. The number of migrant northern flickers was still high. Uh, both ruby crown and golden crown kinglets were also in good number, with ruby crowns nearly twice the number of the goldens. Red breast and nuthatch were tootling their tin horn call in good numbers as well. Wrens included the resident Carolina house and the diminutive winter wren. One resident northern mockingbird made an appearance, always fun. A newer migrant hermit thrush seemed, seemed to take the place of swines and thrush this day. Pine siskins were heard overhead but did not settle into any of the vegetation. Sparrow species were similar to sightings a few days ago. It was nice to see rusty blackbirds splashing in a pool of water. The variety of warblers was lower than three days ago. Yellow rump warblers were present in large numbers and I probably undercounted them. October 11th, uh, she says, Lake Erie water birds were about the same as previous reports, but a great black-backed gull was sighted on the break wall. An osprey as well as bald eagle skirted the shoreline. Again, northern flickers in good numbers. Nice to have blue-headed and red-eyed vireo sighted. Ruby crown kinglets were twice as numerous as golden crowns. Uh, brown creeper, winter wren, a few cray cat birds, both swinesons and hermit the thrush, as well as pine siskins were noted. Once again, a good variety of sparrow species, this time with more white-crowned than white-throated sparrows. Uh, both were a double-digit number, a bit of an uptick in warblers with Tennessee, Nashville, Magnolia, bay-breasted palm, yellow rump, black-throated, green, and as well as common yellow throat being sighted. Yellow rumps were everywhere. And there's a picture of a yellow rump warbler um, at the preserve by Tom Fishburne. And as you can see, it is so named because it has yellow right on its rump. All right, October 18th, as you may note, 
All right, as you may note, the number of species was down from the previous week. The uh, weather was not as good, and birds may have been a bit more reluctant to be seen. A red-shouldered hawk was a good sighting, and only one northern flicker today. Of ruby crown kinglets were low in number, no golden crowns today. Winter wren and hermit thrush numbers were up, and I was surprised to see a couple of gray cat birds. This day, the white-throated sparrows outdid the white-crowned sparrows in numbers by nearly two to one. Warbler species are dropping as we are nearing the end of the main warbler migration. Nashville yellow rumps, still in good numbers, and common yellow throat were all that were found. And then on October 21st, 37 species. Despite the wind, overcast skies, and heavy drizzle part of the day, the birds were still out and about. Um, a nice to see a bald eagle and a red-shouldered hawk. Still had a couple of eastern phoebes, a blue-headed vireo, more ruby crown kinglets than golden crowns. Brown creeper, winter wren, marsh wren, and hermit thrush. The number of white crowned and white throated sparrows were almost neck and neck. A good find was a vesper sparrow among many song sparrows. Uh, wait, what? A bit of an increase in warblers. It's getting late, guys. <laughs> Sighted were orange crown, Nashville palm, lots of yellow rumps, black throated green, and Wilson. Had to add information to eBird on the Wilsons due to it being a rarity at this time of year. It was unmistakable. So I trust Nancy with that. She has been birding for many years and is an expert. Um, and then uh, here's a photo of a white-throated sparrow uh, by Tom Fishburne at the preserve. October 25th, 45 species. Late October, overcast, cool day, yet the birding was good. Sparrows making a great appearance along with other good finds. Waterfowl, gulls, cormorants, yep, Lake Erie produced nice things, including a great black back gull on the water and 150 double-crested cormorants flying over. Don't see belted kingfisher often, but one was hunting in a cove where there were fewer waves. Two raptors today, bald eagle and cooper's hawk, still finding blue-headed vireo, ruby crowned and golden crown kinglets, red-breasted nuthatch, and many winter wrens. At first I thought the same wren was following me and popping out along the trail again and again. Still located a gray catbird and several hermit thrush. More American goldfinch today than other days visiting. Sparrows were numerous. I know I undercounted the number of junco, white throats, and white crowned and songs. Uh, chipping field, fox, white crowned, topped white-throated song lincoln swamp as well as lots of dark-eyed junco and a few eastern tohi didn't anticipate a lot of warbler variety surprise while only two yellow rump warblers were seen so was a tennessee and a black-throated green warbler the last two are rare at this time of year at the clmp so eber needed verification which was provided and i think this is the last october 30th um, 30 species. I hadn't planned on heading out to CLMP, but with the reports that the northern Selwet owl was there, I had to see it. And while at the nature preserve, take a walk. It was a it was a raw weather afternoon with heavy overcast skies, sprinkles and sleet, and wind. Dressing appropriately is the key. One of the first birds sighted were the wild turkeys, actually on the adjacent property, but still counted on my eBird sighting. Lots of dark-eyed juncos and a mix of other sparrows were in the short grass along the drive and parking area. Sparrows include song, chipping, white-throated, and white-crowned. Yes, and in, in high in one of the pines along the wood chip path perched the northern sawwet owl, seemingly unconcerned about the people walking beneath it or the wind. Yay, being out in the afternoon with the weather conditions, I was pleased to find many of the regulars. Lots of ring-billed gulls, along with a few herring gulls and double-crested cormorants, plied Lake Erie's choppy water. An adult bald eagle flew over early in my walk, and a red-shouldered hawk was sighted later. I don't think in all of my other visits that I had great blue heron until today. An equal number of golden crowned and ruby crowned kinglets were tallied, but only singles of winter wren, hermit thrush, and pines of skin. Sparrows in the preserve included field sparrow, a few more juncos, more white crowned than white throated sparrows, and even song sparrows outnumbered white throats. Just a few yellow rumped warblers were seen. Um, and there's the picture of the northern solid owl uh, taken by Tom Fishburn. And he has a cute little face that it's making. Okay, and then here's Nancy's massive list. So um, I, I highlighted the northern solid owl, uh, golden crown and ruby crown kinglets, the house sparrow, uh, the pine siskin I highlighted because that was um, that's kind of a cool one, uh, chipping sparrow field, fox, dark-eyed junco, White crowned, white throated sparrow, Vesper, Savannah Song, and then continuing her list, the Lincoln Sparrow, Swamp, and Eastern Tohi, 
Uh, warblers included the Tennessee, Orange Crown, Nashville, Common Yellowthroat, American Red Start, Northern Perula, Magnolia, Bay Breasted, Black Burnian, Yellow, Black Pole, Palm, Yellow Rumped Warbler, uh, Black Throated Green, and the Wilsons. And then uh, there's a photo of a Nashville Warbler at the preserve by Tom Fishburn. And then um, finally, we're at uh, Tom's um, submission. Uh, Tom, do you want me to take it away, or, or do you want to say anything right now? Well, I think um, you can go ahead. I think um, I ought to follow Nancy around. Uh, maybe I can get more I don't know. numbers <laughs> I, on mine. I am, I'm in agreement with you there. We're going to tag along with her this month. All right. So um, I'm so not really Tom, a, not really a here. But I let I let my camera do the do the work really for right. those parts. So so you go ahead. You, yeah. You got it all laid out. Okay. No problem. Um, so Tom visited the preserve four times: October 5th, 8th, 13th, and 27th. Um, October 5th, in the woods, a common yellowthroat warbler pause long enough for a focused shot, and the hermit thrushes are migrating too. Um, so there, there's the, the common yellow throat and the hermit thrush, two beautiful pictures. Nice, clear, crisp photos. I love it. All right, and then what a joy. A flurry of flickers were flying back and forth. The only red eye viewer I saw this day, um, the eye would be red in the right light on an adult. This could be a young un. Uh, so it's just a beautiful picture of um, a flicker in flight. Um, I, just, I just love how the sunlight is reflecting on the yellow. Um, very pretty shot. And then the red eye vireo um, on the, the right hand side there. Uh, October 8th. When I arrived on October 8th, I heard the chatter as soon as I got out of my car. I quickly grabbed my camera and saw this one high up in the pine. I wanted to see this bird high up in the pine. Red breasted nuthatch. Uh, there were several scurrying about near the CLMP parking lot. So. I, I love that shot on the left, a very playful shot. It looks like it was just coming down the land or just lifting up or, or something, but it's definitely kind of up in the air, um, and you capture that beautifully. And then here it is um, sitting on the pine cone on the right-hand side there. Uh, the only field sparrow I saw on October 8th at the CLNP Dyke 14 and a pine siskin on the fence. Um, I, I love that picture of the field sparrow and that pine siskin photo is a really great urban birding picture with it on that chain link fence there. So a palm warbler gets settled only because it constantly pumped its tail. I was able to identify this as a palm warbler myself. Um, and that's, that really is the case. You know, sometimes it's their behaviors that give us a clue as, as to what the bird is. Um, so it's important not only to pay attention to those field marks, um, but, you know, what's it doing? Uh, and that can give us a big clue. And so here, um, I believe, is the sequence of it coming into land and then finally settling um, on the right-hand side there. So I was fascinated by the lighter shades on this dark-eyed junco. I ended up taking 60 shots of this intriguing junco. And that is a really light junco, and it's um, a beautiful one. And then uh, this picture on the left is, I think, my favorite picture of the entire field trip that anyone took. Um, as I mentioned before, white crown sparrows are my favorite sparrow. Might be my favorite, but I really don't think I have a favorite bird. Um, but these sparrows are my favorite, and it's just a beautiful backlit photo. Um, so October 13th is when Tom saw this, a, a backlit photo of a white crown sparrow down the wet trail at CLMP, a.k.a. Dyke 14, likely, and, and then on the right-hand side there, likely the resident Cooper's hawk that had been around hunting at the CLNP. So two beautiful photos there. And then October 27th, amazing how Deb Sweeney spotted this northern Selwet owl 30 feet or more up in the pine. Um, so, yeah, Deb, congratulations for finding that wonderful owl and sharing it with all of us. Um, and then Jen, Jen Brumfield identified this red-necked uh, fallow rope out, uh, out a ways in Lake Erie off the northeast corner of Dyke 14. So it, it's, it's, yeah, it's two very um, good birds to see on the field trip for sure. Oh, and then... Uh, 
that wraps this up. Thank you to Marianne and John Henderson, Al Rand, Sean Missig, Nancy Howell, and Tom Fishburne for your contributions. And then a huge thanks to the Port of Cleveland for the Cleveland Lakefront Nature Preserve. Um, the CLNP is located directly behind the Cleveland Metro Parks Lakefront Office at 8701 Lakeshore Boulevard. Um, and then you can always visit wcautobahn.org for more virtual field trip opportunities. Um, and then a beautiful picture of a chipping sparrow uh, by Tom Fishburne there on the left. Um, so with that, I'm going to open up um, for a conversation or discussion. So if anyone has anything to say or um, anything to share, if you happen to go on the field trip, uh, feel free to unmute your line or, or send a chat and I can read uh, your comment. I want to <clears throat> I want to ask um, a question of the photographers, Tom. That includes you and Sean, you and Michelle. Um, <clears throat> how do you how do you find? Um, do you stand and wait for birds to come to you? Do you walk along and find your opportunities, or how do you? How do you find these beautiful shots? Because, uh, well, Tom, you're just my favorite. I just love short bird photographs. They're just wonderful. They're they're so lifelike, and it's almost like you weren't there taking the photo. It's like when you get them, like Michelle was saying, in flight and and all the different ways that you do that. I'd like to know more about that. And Michelle. Um, you seem to be, I mean, all of your shots are getting more in focus and better. I, I mean, I've just seen you growing as a photographer really quickly on this. And I wondered um, how you get that focus on the bird and then the kind of the, I don't know, the I don't want to say frothy, but just kind of the out of focus, but still good enough that you know what's there, like the reeds or the pines or whatever. And Sean, um, I think you get some, I mean, that buff, that, that the way you frame your photos is just phenomenal. I mean, that one of the six-point buck, it's like, how did you get your framing so good? Do you crop? Do you, or what, how does that happen? So anyway, Anybody want to be first? I'd like to just hear some thoughts from all of you. I, I just think this would be, a, I, I'm never going to be a great bird photographer, but I, I, I would like to know. This is Tom. And um, as far as, you know, sitting and waiting, I don't do a whole lot of that. Um, somewhat. Like the that northern flicker in flight, um, I took a little bit of um, waiting and watching the flickers go back and forth and kind of getting ready. Um, yeah. I was, I've been waiting a long time to get a picture like that. Um, and um, you know, I, I take a lot of pictures. A lot of it's trial and error, you know, for me. So I, I do take more uh, bad pictures than I take good pictures. But I um, take so many, some of them have to be good. Um, I generally I have I have some trouble just staying in one spot unless I have a suspicion waiting is going to you know pay off. Hey Sean, why don't you pitch in here? Sounds good. Um, in terms of my methods, uh, I use a lot when it comes to trying to get the shots. Sometimes it is a sit and wait if I've noticed a lot of action or movement or if I'm noticing a, a pattern from a specific species. Um, a lot of times, though, it's more or less I'm just kind of walking along and I see something and, and I take it. Um, of course, having a zoom lens with some reach is definitely key. Uh, if I didn't have my lens that I have now, the majority of these shots would not happen. Um, and to your comment about the composition of my photographs, I usually do not crop 
any of my photos. The only time I'm ever cropping is if the surrounding area around the subject is bad or if um, I specifically just want only the subject in the photo. Um, I'm definitely a very uh, composition-heavy photographer. I always look for the composition more so than um, just the subject. And to Tom's point, I also take a lot of photos. So my keeper to bad ratio is, is very low. Um, as it is, I just went out on Monday and I took over a thousand shots on Monday. And out of that, I think I kept maybe 130 or 160 or something. So it's definitely just kind of firing, especially for the ones that move very fast. Um, that's, that's about what I do. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, it, it, same, same with me um, as with Tom and Sean, uh, as far as the number of photos taken, I, I, <laughs> I, I take hundreds of pictures and then when I get home, usually, you know, 15 to 20 might have turned out. Um, and, and also I think it's the subject matter when you're trying to photograph birds, they're moving, you know, there's so many shots that um, I just wasn't quick enough on the, the trigger, so there's nothing there. <laughs> left wondering, oh, did I just think that was a pretty tree or was there something sitting in it? Um, but, uh, and, and thank you, Gloria, for the compliment that it, you've seen improvement in my photography. Um, uh, for all of you on the line, I just got a camera in May. Um, and so I've been slowly learning how to use it and, and learning how to be a photographer. Um, and I, I, I would say that I do rely on cropping heavily. I rely on bringing my photos into a program for some color correction as well. So I don't know if that's something that, um, you know, as you get more experience as a photographer and learning your camera settings, if, you know, you don't have to do that as much. Um, but I, I do bring them in and edit them and, and color correct. Um, yeah. So, and then I, as far as how I find the birds, I have never been one to sit still. You know, before I was a birder and a photographer, I always liked hiking. I like moving uh, when I go out to, to natural spaces. So birding has helped me slow down a little bit. Uh, I just don't see myself being someone that would just stop for a very long time. So usually, you know, I'll, I'll walk kind of slowly. Um, and then, you know, when I see movement, that's when I'll stop and I'll try to see what's there, just, you know, as I do when I'm birding. Um, and then, you know, if, there, if there's a lot of birds, yeah, I'll stay there for a long time because I'll be, you know, actively taking pictures and, and, you know, engaging in that activity. Um, but, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't think I've ever gone to an area and sat down to watch the birds except for um, maybe through my home office window because there's a bird feeder right outside. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's my comment. You know, Nancy, Nancy has a, the best ear to listen to birds. Yeah. Um, and uh, she's so she's so good at recognizing them. It's 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 phenomenal. You know, um, where I can hear birds, but I don't always know what they are. But uh, you know, part of it is when I hear them, I'll try to pay attention and and uh, maybe give things a little bit more time to see if I can find the bird and and hopefully be ready when I see it. Um, like, but when I, with that red-breasted nuthatch, I mentioned, um, I heard them right away when I got out of my car that day. And, uh, the, the one that, uh, you saw, you know, in the air off the pine cone, it was actually leaving the pine cone. I happened to catch it as, as it, as it jumped off. So that, that was lucky. <laughs> yeah, that was a nice I think shot. That is. I like that. I did too. I think that happens. I know with even like the Audubon uh, photo contest or national uh, wildlife, the the winners will say, you know, this this was, you know, one of my last shots. I I thought I wasn't going to have anything for that day, or you know, it, it just was lucky. It was still a, a lucky shot, and you know that they really are good at, at what they do. But uh, Tom, this gives me. Uh, I was telling Betsy the other day. I love the fact that you go to Mohican and to 
Kilbuck Valley and uh, Brownsburg because I grew up there. That was where I yeah. was a kid. So when I yeah. see you going down, you know, these roads and things and you're, you know, and I, and you're saying where you are, I go, oh, that's where my dad and I, you know, harvested watercress or, oh, that's where my aunt and I used to take, you know, hikes in Mohican. And it, it just, it's really great. It's, a, it's, it's something more special for me than, um, it's more than birds for me. So I really thank you for that. I've, I told Betsy, I said, I got to just email him or something. And here you are tonight. So I get to thank you in person. So, but Sean, thank you. Um, I, I hope that me saying I loved your composition of the, the buck, uh, says, Hey, you know, I'm doing something right here because Gloria noticed it or something. It's a it's kind of, yeah, I'm, no. I'm not a, a real photographer. I love photography, but I'm kind of like Michelle. I jump around too much and not really kind of like into finding light and contrast and things. So I've never really done much of it. So I'm thinking that maybe I might in the next few years since now I'm retired and everything. So um, anyway, thank you all for uh giving some tips uh, some for some people because I know there are a lot of people that would like to try to photography but they think it's kind of insurmountable. So I think that I'm glad you answered my question. Thank you very much. You're well, welcome. And you. you know, the best way to really um, get good at photography is just to practice, you know, you're going to go out the first few times and you're going to get blurry birds or, and you just have to keep at it. Just keep learning your camera and, and practicing and, you know, the, the old adage is, is right. Practice makes perfect or at least close to it. So don't give up. I do want to Any say other thank comments? you for the oh, compliment. Um, I do appreciate that. Uh, similar to Michelle, I actually just started doing photography this year as well, and I actually started on the first day of the year. Um, and I had somewhat of an idea. I had taken some courses from a friend of mine who is actually a studio photographer. So I learned the basics, but I knew nothing in terms of catching wildlife and doing anything out in the open. And uh, as, as Michelle said, it's practice. Get out there and just do it. And you are going to take many, many just absolute terrible shots. And you just have to power through that and figure out what works. But, yeah, it's been a, it's been a great journey. And uh, it's something I'm just going to take with me for as long as I can. Photography is great. So if you want to get into it, I highly recommend getting into it because a lot of these cameras now, uh, you can just put things in auto. And mm -hmm. you can let the camera do all the work. And, I mean, sure, you're, you know, it's it's not necessarily going to get you uh, the same as somebody who actually breaks down all of the different functions of the camera and sets everything to what they like. But it's certainly going to get you good enough shots. So if you want to do it, I highly recommend getting into it. Sean, I, I want to compliment you on your uh, the way you express what you're seeing, your vocabulary is wonderful, and I like the way you you um, um, compare what you're seeing to to something or other. Uh, how you how you describe uh, your your photo and the results. I I, I think that's really neat. I have a terrible I mean, a terrible weak vocabulary myself, and. Uh, and so it's always neat when somebody can kind of uh, put things into perspectives, and I, and I like the way you do that. Um, but I also have a question for you, too, in, in the fact that you don't do much uh, uh, cropping, because I do a lot of cropping. Um, when you take your photos, um, uh, how, how do you set your camera to focus then? Um, I mean, do you, uh, and do you, do you use automatic settings? Do you have a... Um, uh, a preference to um, uh, set your camera on a certain kind of setting. 
Well, first off, thank you, Tom. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, I'm actually a little bit of a writer. I'm, I'm sure that kind of comes through. Um, Michelle, I just might work on a poem for this next month because I know you said you oh, wanted a poem. Yay! Yes, so I'll, I do. <laughs> I'll see, see what I can do. Um, writing has yeah. been something that I've done since high school. So, um, you know, like with my uh, photos, I try and tell a story with the photos, and that's kind of what I try to do with my explanations is bring that photo to life then through the words. Um, so thank you. I do appreciate you noticing that. And, uh, yeah, if you, if you need some vocabulary, let me know. I can teach you. Um, as for my camera settings, uh, it really just depends on what's going on. Um, I am using a rather versatile lens. I have a lens that goes from 18 to 400 millimeters uh, from Tamron. And I absolutely love it just for its versatility. Um, I am running it on a camera that does have an APS-C sensor. So I do have the crop factor in there. So even though it says 400, I'm really getting a reach of close to around, I think, 640 or 660 on a full-frame sensor. Um, so I do get a little bit of extra reach with that. Uh, the one setting that I usually do keep the same is I keep my aperture at F8. Uh, I do that for a couple of reasons. One, I find that it seems to be about the sharpest for the aperture on that lens. Uh, two, it also gives me a really good solid depth of field for my photos. So that way I'm not running into like the head of the bird um, being in focus and then the tail not being in focus. Uh, so I do like it for the depth of field. And I do find that when I go shooting, normally it is bright. So I don't run into any issues with not having enough light or having to uh, set the ISO really high. Uh, I also like to use auto ISO um, just because that's one less thing that I have to worry about. And I do cap my ISO at 6,400 uh, to hopefully avoid a whole bunch of grain in the photo. Um, I am using a Canon M50. So... It does good up until about 6,400, and after that, then I get a lot of grain. And sometimes Lightroom can do a good job taking it out. Other times, it's just too much, and the, the photo is just gone, and I get rid of it. Um, so I do usually use that. However, if I need to, I will take it out of auto ISO and throw it higher. Um, so usually it's just the shutter speed that I'm messing around with. I try and keep that at around uh, one five hundredth of a second, uh, unless I'm chasing after something that's really fast. Um, then I'll try and go up to eight hundredth of a second or a thousandth of a second. Um, and especially if I have the light, if I have more than enough light, I will certainly lock it in at about one one thousandth of a second and uh, just kind of fire away. I try and stay in autofocus. And I bounce between the um, zone autofocus with tracking and the single point. Sometimes I have found that I do have to put it in manual just because the camera doesn't want to recognize the bird as a focal point. It'll grab um, a branch behind it or a leaf behind it or something. And so I'll take a bunch of shots and think, oh, this is great. And it just turns out that I've got blurry birds. Um, so sometimes manual focus does come into play. However, I do use the, um, the peaking function for that so that when it is in focus, it highlights red in my viewfinder. And I found that that is very useful for me because using manual focus before, I was thinking things were in focus. And when I uploaded the pictures to the computer, I quickly realized it was not in focus at all. Um, but like I said, I try and stick with auto. Um, especially for things that are flying through the air. And I hope that covered everything you were asking about, Tom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you know, it, with limited composition, recomposing what you do, like you say, cropping, uh, I think the focus um, can be very challenging to get that right. So it's, it's interesting your answer. I do appreciate it.
Well, then I should ask the same of you. What are you doing to get your shots? Because you definitely are getting great shots and many great shots. And I'm jealous because you get to go out a lot more than I do. And I'm going, man, I want to get out and get more, but I can't because it works. But is what it is. Yeah, well, I, I use a, um, a 400 millimeter lens, no zoom. Um, it's, a, a, it's a Canon lens that's particularly designed for birds in flight, but uh, I can use it otherwise, you know, too. And um, but, I, but I typically center focus on the just in the middle there, and I do you know um, you know recompose and crop. So uh, you know as far as the focusing part goes, um, I'm usually focusing you know, right on the bird um, and uh, not worrying about much else. Um, I am learning better to. To look at the background as I go. I don't, you know, when I have time to anyway. So if I can reposition myself somehow, the birds cooperative, you know, I might be able to get a better background. Um, but um, for the most part, it's just a matter of trying to, um, you know, kind of be ready for uh, uh, what I think is going to happen. Um, and, um, you know, I do change my settings, uh, you know, quite a bit. So it's just, that depends on the situation, but um, as far as my um, my um, say shutter speed, I, I don't really shoot for manual at all. Sometimes I do, um, but sometimes I'll just change my exposure compensation. But I usually shoot on f5.6. Sometimes I'll bump it up a little bit more, um, but um, I'm not concerned too much about depth of field. Typically, the birds um, far away from me. But, um, but I, I do a lot of um, uh, re recomposing. Um, Michelle had mentioned that she changes, you know, does color correction. Um, what I do is I tend to shoot dark. Uh, I do exposure correction. I don't, you know, color I don't usually do much with. Maybe I'll add a little saturation or something or vibrancy. But um, I typically will shoot as fast as I can and shoot a little darker and bright it up at home. Yeah, the color correction I do is um, I, I play with the saturation. I usually have to bump that up a little bit. Um, and then I will also adjust the contrast. Usually I'm bumping that up a little bit too um, to get the image a little sharper. And then depending on how, how that looks, I might need to adjust the brightness either up or down a little bit. But those are really the three settings I work with as far as color correction. And then um, obviously I, I crop my photos too. I'm, I'm working with a 300 millimeter lens at the zoom lens. Um, so sometimes I don't get as close to the bird as I want to, <laughs> so, so hence the cropping. I uh, that's the and... basic. Yeah, I was going to say just, you know, basic exposure changes like what Michelle's doing. That's, that's pretty normal, really. Uh, go ahead, Sean. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to say that um, I try not to overcorrect anything. So, um, you know, I do mess around with the colors and contrast and stuff, but the majority of the wildlife photos that I take, when I say it's done, I want it to look natural. You know, I still want it to pop. I still want it to look very good, but I don't want it to have that over-processed look because, I do not like over-processing. I do not like anything that looks fake. You know, like if, if the bird is super bright, you know, we're, we're not in the tropics. We're not at the zoo seeing these <laughs> giant parrots that are really bright. Like, I don't like that. So I try and keep that to a minimum as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you there, too. I, I like a realistic look, for sure. And, um, you know, Contrast in particular can can um, can overdo it uh, if if you add too much contrast to a picture. But a lot of times that's just just enough to make it uh, a little sharper. You know, to adding a little contrast. Right. Well, thanks for answering my questions, Tom. Nice to know. No problem. All right, we are at. 
or just past 8 o'clock. Are there any additional comments or questions before we wrap up this evening? Hey, Michelle, thank you very much for all you're doing to put this scrapbook together. And uh, I'm pleasure. glad I finally have I have an internet connection here that I can actually I know, I know it's been great having you interact with us finally. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Michelle, everyone. All right. Thank you, Karu. All Bye. right. Well, if that um, is it, then uh, thank you, everyone, for joining me this evening. And I hope to see you all um, next month when uh, I present the Richfield Heritage Preserve um, field trip scrapbook. All right. So enjoy the rest of your evening, everyone. Thank you.